Welcome to uh, Witnessing Palestine from Mondo Weiss. I'm Frank Barrett. Uh, this is the first episode of Witnessing Palestine, a new program from Mondo Weiss that invites influential activists from around the world to discuss current developments in the struggle for Palestinian freedom. As we, as we record this program, Gaza has been under Israeli bombardment for the last uh, 70 days. Over 18,000 Palestinians in Gaza have died. Uh, more than 50,000 have been wounded. Uh, however, the true number is likely much higher because many people remain buried under the rubble of buildings. But this is not it. 18 months ago, so nearly a year and a half ago, uh, the charity Save the Children said that four out of five children in Gaza after 15 years of blockade, lived in depression, grief, and fear. And this is not it either. The Israeli military also, while the focus has been on Gaza, and the settlers are continuing to ramp up their actions in the West Bank. A large invasion of Jenin has been ongoing for several days, and the Israeli military has killed, injured, and arrested many Palestinians there. Um, this show is called Witnessing Palestine, and Witnessing Palestine, in a way, is what I feel I've been doing for the last 16 years. My first visit in 2007 actually changed my life. Um, I saw then what I could not unsee since, and uh, since then I've embarked, in a way, on a journey of uh, growth and understanding. On this journey and whatever, this path, I've, um, I have met people that have uh, taken me by the hand, taking me to places I didn't know existed. Uh, they opened doors for me. They took me along in a way their, their own personal journey and helped me grow both as an activist and as a human being. Um, and I'm honored to be joined tonight by one of these people, Nura Erkat. Nura is a human rights attorney and an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. She's an editorial committee member of the Journal for Palestine Studies and co-founding editor of Jadalia. Nora, sorry, was long, but thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, and thank you for, for grounding us in the human and in the connection. And indeed, this has been a journey. Um, I think all of us, regardless of where we stand, uh, because of our openness to growth and change, are continuously um, seeing and learning new things. And so you two have changed me along that journey. So thank you now uh, for this offering that you're making. Thanks, Tura. Uh, in a way, we, I've been wanting to, to talk to you for, for a few weeks. You know, you know that. We've been in touch on WhatsApp and stuff. And to, obviously, we're not like a news media. I'm not a news media. I want to talk to you more about what do we do as people, as activists, as human beings, when we're faced with, in a way, mm. collective trauma, uh, grief, and anger. You know, how, how do we not crumble? Uh, you said recently, I think, to a group of students, we wake up and we're not sure what today is going to be like. So, and that's why... A lot of us have been feeling in the last few weeks, you, you don't even want to switch on the news because you're worried another hospital would have been bombed, and another thousand kids would have been dead, killed. So how do we keep going, you know, as human beings in front of such collective trauma and grief? Yeah, that's a wonderful, it's a wonderful way to open and a very, um, I think, vulnerable way to open. Um, you know, in my reference, every night, Every night I sleep in the same way or attempt to sleep in the same way, which is deep, deep prayer, right? The willing and the faith that in the morning there will be a ceasefire, my time, right? Um, and, I, and I have turned in this moment um, as a very secular human, <laughs> I've turned to lots of prayer to be able to fill the gaps of this grief and to be able to fill the gaps in the ineptitude Of, of leadership and the institutions that should have made this moment impossible, unfathomable. 
And when I wake up in the morning and do not find that there is a ceasefire, oftentimes um, there's a mix, right? It's less, I'm always going to turn on the news. It's not the trepidation to do that, but really the feeling is inside of me. My spirit has fluctuated and has not been the same. You know, it's really, you know, and I think a lot of Palestinians have answered the question when people ask them, how are they? You know, I've answered that question in, you know, to pa other Palestinians as I'm exactly like you. And I've answered the question to, you know, almost everyone else by explaining every day is different. Today I am and fill in the blank. And so on some days, like the day before yesterday, I had an unprecedented feeling of energy and, and fight. It was a wonderful feeling. I haven't had that feeling probably in the, in, you know, in those 68 days that preceded it. And I wanted to hold on to it thinking maybe this would last. I had the energy to pick up all the phone calls and to run and to multitask and to, to do the interview and, and jump on um, to the email and then take the emergency phone call. And then yesterday, I didn't feel like that. <laughs> yesterday, I was devastated and I was, you know, strung together by a, a, a panic attack. Just I was on the edge of a panic attack all day so that I didn't even have, um, I didn't even have the patience to be as kind as I would like to in my interactions and responses. Because every request just felt like the end of me because it, what if I could not respond adequately? Uh, and today is yet to be seen. Yeah, it's, I guess. Yeah. yeah, today is yet to be seen. I mean, I've, I've started already, but, and taken the, phone calls and responded to the crises and tried to write. But, you know, I, there's a way in which, um, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little bit, I haven't figured it out yet. This is going to be good or bad. Um, how is it that we get by? Well, one my instinct tells me, and I'm going to, I don't know. I imagine this is how other people feel that I've spoken to. My instinct every day tells me, um, to hide. And I have hidden for a long time. I've self-isolated. I don't have, you know, I don't want to, you know, people who want to hang out, I'm, al I'm almost annoyed. I'm like, to do what? You know, unless you want to watch the news together mm. or to work together, you know what I mean? And my instinct is uh, to, 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 to retreat. And yet it's precisely against, um, it's, it's precisely in fighting that instinct in which I've developed the energy and cultivated in order to continue. It's precisely when I've agreed, you know, to come out into a home where friends have gathered in collective prayer and grief that I felt better. It's precisely when um, I see other people who, who are also holding grief so that we can hold it together that I feel better. Um, it's precisely when I've gone to the poetry reading for Palestine where when I walked into the room, I hid all the way in the back because I couldn't stomach looking at anybody in the eye. That by the end of that reading, I felt that the words and the collective energy in that room massaged a spiritual knot that gave me enough energy to go on for maybe two more days. So yeah, I think, I think Frank, my advice is you know, generically, we tell people we're all we got, we have to survive. And yet in these moments of extreme, extenuating, grotesque circumstances, the hardest thing to do is to be with one another and to expand our capacity uh, for, you know, that collective moment as opposed to working for another five hours incessantly on something. Um that I have found, I have found that that's given me enough energy to go on. You know what, I, maybe two to three days, if I'm lucky five days before that spiritual resolve dissolves once again. In a way, like, do you, do you try to hold on to the beauty? And because and, that's what, I don't know if you know what I mean, but that's what I've, I mean, what we're experiencing is horrible. It's, I've never experienced anything like this in my life, you know, I've, followed Palestine for 15, 20 years, uh, and there's a moment of um, a breakdown, you know, that is, I feel I've been, in a way, 
on the ver- on the verge of tears for about eight weeks now. It's always fighting. You know, what do you, do you keep above or do you stay above or do you go down? You know, but the I mean, I live in Brussels. I've met over the last the last eight weeks. 200 people I didn't know eight weeks ago, people from all walks of life that have stopped Mm. everything. And I think if we don't hold to this beauty, we crumble. But do you know what I mean? No, absolutely. Listen, on one, I want to, you know, point out two things in what you said. Number two, and you said you've never experienced this. I just want to emphasize this is, this is a collective human catastrophe. Yes, it hits, um, far deeper for Palestinians who are literally being subject to a genocide and whose very existence, which was, you know, always expressed by the right wing as, as the existential threat, as the threat to the world, as the problem that needed to be solved is now on, you know, the top level of the agenda across mainstream media, government, and even university administrations, right? That, you know, so, but this is a human this is a human experience. One, you know, you described 200 people that have stopped everything. It does remind me of the moment, you know, that the same way that in, in its international nature, uh, the pandemic of COVID yeah. made us all experience the same thing. Palestine is actually sustaining a collective global experience for us in an unprecedented way in this moment. And it's, it's heightened by the fact that technological advancements make it such that we are literally witnessing the grotesque nature, not just the metaphorical, the hypothetical, right? But the literal grotesque nature of genocidal violence um, and the, the colonial order that sustains it. Um, so yeah, in in these moments, it's I know it's where the be- the beauty is the beauty is in the promise and the resolve, right? The beauty for me, I've seen many many times. It was you know I forget her name and I and and if she sees this, forgive me. I apologize to you if you're watching this. Uh, the NYU law student who single handedly made the entire administration tremble and then refused to back down. She was so filled with this sense of truth. She's not Palestinian. She was so imbued with this sense of truth nonetheless and the threats that came with it and the, you know, national attacks that she came on to democracy now and held strong. Wow. Hmm. What beauty did I see in that humanity and what humans are capable of? Um, what beauty, what beauty in, in, in the incessant and brave and unprecedented offering of Palestinian journalists, like Wa'el Dahdouh, whose wife and children were killed and who stood in front of the camera to continue in that duty. What strength there. Or from Martez and Bissan and Saleh and Plastia, who frankly, you know, Frank, are, are you know, just above being children. Yeah. They, even, they barely cross the threshold of sh- childhood. They're in their 20s. What are other people doing in their 20s? Right? Mm-hmm. And yet... In that moment, right, Plastia finds a turtle, you know, is gifted a turtle from from an elder woman who gives it to her and she rejoices in that turtle. In that moment, she plays Uno with a number of Palestinian children sipping tea in a tent. Uh, And it's it's that. It's not just, you know, our commitment to fighting is first and foremost a commitment to life. And to witness that commitment in that way is is very beautiful. Is precisely is precisely um, what sustains us and what has made us, you know, evolve. I hope for the better as as humanity or parts of humanity. Yeah. I mean, we will get into that. I think that humanity is a false construct at this point. Yeah. Um, but you know, in in those things that you know, so many of us consider as the most essential things that make us that make us alive. Yeah. 
Thanks, Nura. I, I mentioned, uh, uh, like, when I started, like, the journey, the path that we are all embarked on, you know, and, uh, you know, other people, other people with a capital P have experienced genocide, have experienced ethnic cleansing before. Exactly. I was wondering, what do you see as the most useful lessons from indigenous thinkers and indigenous movements at, at, this, at this time? Thank you. So I, I want to lift up that, you know, I want to lift up that in addition to indigenous peoples who have endured many stages of genocide, right, um, and apocalypse, mm. right, this world shattering, like we can talk about the loss of life, but there's a loss of life in which, you know, you have a world to continue in. And then there's a loss of life, as in this moment, where nothing, right, around you. Is your world is shattered, your streets, your homes, your schools, your places of worship, your community gatherings, corners that mark memories, right? Even, even relationships with one another that have been shattered. That this is apocalyptic in that sense. And beyond indigenous peoples who have endured this apocalypse, Palestinians endured it at least twice in 48 and 67, right? Um, you know, some might say even uh, in 82 after the invasion of Lebanon, but the apocalypse of African descendant peoples who have been kidnapped and enslaved, their lives ripped apart repeatedly every single day in, in the prevention of even being able to keep, to sustain family as families were turned into Um, isolated, alienable property, yeah. and, he, and, and Jewish life, and the apocalypse that was experienced um, in, in, in the Holocaust. Also a memory of apocalypse that has animated, um, you know, the descendants of, 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 of those Jews in, um, in particular in many different directions. Some have been animated in order to make sure it never happens again because they know it and others have been animated in, to make sure it doesn't happen again to them even if the rest of the world, as they know it, becomes more dangerous. Um, so what do we learn from indigenous scholars? I mean, which ones hmm. and how? Um, I, I, I have particularly lifted up and mentioned... Um, Audra Simpson, Nick Estes, who is a dear friend, um, Maya McDashi, Irana Barakat is, is an indigenous Palestinian indigenous scholar. Uh, Maya is a Lebanese um, Ojibwe indigenous scholar. Um, I, I want to lift up Glenn Coltard, who has taught me much. And just in those limited readings, what we get is a, is a few things. And one is an insistence that we live on a continuum of settler time that renders a, the, the, an indigenous peoples to a past, right? To some past that we can never go back to and, and almost freezes indigenous people um, in not only to the past, but also, you know, freezes them in a moment of time that then counts against them if they evolve as communities. You're not as indigenous yeah. if you're not necessarily on the land or you've evolved in different ways. So one is a rejection of settler time, but that indigenous time continues that disrupts that, right? Uh, another is, is the concept that Nur Jud, as a Palestinian indigenous scholar, gives us in her study of Hawaii and Palestine, of geography, of place. So many of the places that we know are also settler places, settler geography that very thinly veils indigenous knowledge, right? Right before it, around it, on it, we're on it. Uh, another is the concept of indigenous um, sovereignty, that the concept of sovereignty that we have learned, you know, very traditionally, especially enshrined in international law, is a concept of sovereignty that ties Um, self-governance and self-determination to territory and statehood. Whereas, right, Audra Simpson reminds us that there are these concepts of nested sovereignty, 
We're like the Mohawk nation that straddles a settler border between the United States and Canada. They actually are their settler sovereign team within their bodies as they travel with it, as they sustain it together. Another concept is, um, you know, a, a refusal, a politics of refusal um, and a demand for non-recognition, like Glenn Coulthard, who has shown us that recognition by the settler sovereign is actually a trap, mm. that U.S. recognition of indigenous nations, um, and this echoes the work of Edom Katachu and John Reynolds, you know, of repressive inclusion, that inclusion in these frameworks, in these settler frameworks, doesn't necessarily make us stronger, right? And the PLO has fallen into that trap but that the inclusion of these frameworks actually actually just traps us in somebody else's concept of life. Oh, and and I, and I'll, the last one that I'll that I'll, you know, share is indigenous resurgence. Indigenous resurgence um and this is the work of John um Corntassel who, you know, points out that similar to this idea of nested sovereignty, that resurgence in one's community when we turn away from the settler sovereign and actually work on our own community, that we are doing the work of decolonization because we are building for the life after, mm. right? We are building for the life that, you know, we are planting the seeds and from these seeds grows the life that we want rather than just continuously focusing on our settler sovereign, the colonial domination that we want to remove. Um, lessons are abundant. Um, and, I, and I encourage those, all of us, I encourage all of us, especially those who live as settlers as I do on, on um, stolen lands to not fetishize uh, indigenous uh, histories and struggles in communities, but to engage with them in a way that reflects an ethical uh, solidarity in, in moving forward. Because the struggle for Palestine is a struggle for all indigenous peoples. The struggle for Palestine is a struggle against all, you know, colonization and against all racial domination. And that has to be true everywhere and not just in one place. I'm, I'm glad you actually mentioned a, a common friend, John Reynolds. Um, because he's the one, I spoke to him today and he said, ask Noura about indigenous, uh, you know, lessons and stuff. So that was his question. Yeah, that was, Thanks, that John. That was his question. You know, John and I, and, and you know, <laughs> John is Irish. Yeah, I know. And I always joke, no, no, I always joke that my visit um, to, to, to Dublin to share the book talk was the first time I was in Europe and I didn't feel like I was in white society, <laughs> interestingly. I mean, I think Irish identity and whiteness shifts, mm. right, from the United States yeah, yeah. and in Ireland. So it's, you know, and it also reflects race as a construct, um, as a social construction. But the other thing about John is he and I have been working on a book project together that has been, you know, the provisional title of which was Confronting Zionism, Dismantling the Apartheid of Our Time, Taking on the Reticence of Those Who Described Israel as overseeing an apartheid regime from actually grappling with the Zionist ideology that actually drives, mm -hmm. right? Genocidal expansion and territorial consolidation. Yeah. And so, you know, we've been thinking about this uh, for quite some time. And, and now we're in a moment where, you know, we've been, we've been going back. What happens now with this project? Because the terms have shifted so fast, so radically. So in such revolutionary ways, right? That even though the, the discussion of racism and racial colonialism more specifically, which is apartheid, apartheid is a racial colonial structure. It's not, you know, it's been domesticated in international law as a concept, but it is a, it's a racial colonial structure. It's global in its dimension. Um, even though genocide would not have been possible without the thorough dehumanization that that racial colonialism actually um, facilitated, yeah. right? You, how, how, how could you have possibly, uh, embarked on this genocidal campaign if there wasn't already a priming that Palestinians didn't deserve to live or somehow that they're, if they do, it's a privilege yeah. and that they have to somehow sign a contract of being, you know, uh, you know, good natives in order, mm. in order to live. I mean, that's literally what they have been told, which makes this moment possible. 
And yet, you know, this moment makes it, does that feel, does that, um, does that conversation almost feel too far away now? Yeah. Um, so just something that we've been thinking about. Sounds, sounds great. <laughs> I, um, I mean, John and yourself, and I'm going to move to a more, you know, because, you know, I know you're in high demand. I don't want to keep you for four hours because we could actually talk for about four hours. But um, And we have, haven't we, Frank? <laughs> in Belgium. And we have, yes. John and yourself also uh, legal scholars. And I wanted to ask you something because, like, what, what, what's been happening forever, you know, with, with Palestine from Operation Cast Lead in 2009 until now is um, people looking at legal institutions, the ICJ, the ICC, uh, domestic courts, uh, to actually, in a way, break the impunity of, of, of Israel, Israeli uh, generals and, and politicians. Um, but you've recently also said that institutions, and legal, including legal institutions, have been structures in our domination, talking about the domination of the Palestinian people. What do you mean by that? Yeah, no, I think it's really confusing because I'm trained as a human rights attorney. I, you know, I'm, that's my experience before I entered the academy. It continues to be the subject of my, you know, a, a, a big part of my own research. And so, you know, I think it's very confusing to general audiences who look to me like, you're a lawyer and you have a hammer, go find a nail. <laughs> you know, this is George Bouchera, who actually is a mentor um, and taught me a, um, at one point. And he, this, his reprieve that lawyers are given hammers and so they look for nails mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, and yet, you know, one of the things that I've learned in my own work and my own experience and research is that the law, the law works against us. Right. And I say in my book, law is power. Mm -hmm. Law is power. And to the extent that it could be used in the service of emancipatory struggles, it has to be done so on behalf of very, you know, strategic political campaigns, not the other way around. Right? Because if law is power, then our primary concern needs to be power. How do we grow it? What do we make of it? And in that context, we can use the law merely as a tactic, but not as a strategy. And so I, I think that, you know, for us to formally think, you know, to, to and, I, and I trace this history for 100 years between 1917 and 2017, and in fact show that Israel has used international law far more to its advantage than Palestinians have. Obviously, this is a reflection of power as well, but it's also a reflection of that uh, strategic appreciation of the law, right? In this moment, we're seeing something very similar where there is this mobilization to use, especially amongst the, the, um, the legal professionals for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect, notwithstanding a pos this possible strategic disagreement, you know, to find all the small legal mechanisms in which to enter at the UN and beyond the da -da 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 -da, the petitions and so on and so forth. And, you know, my, my thought has been since 2014, at least when Palestine began to discuss its accession to the Rome statute that would have made it a member of, uh, of the ICC, of which now it, it is, and it's recognized, um, that we should never believe that these institutions are going to work in our favor, right? That... These very institutions, by their nature, even looking at the document that established the ICC, the 1998 Rome Statute, in the words of scholar Kamari Maxine Clark, enshrines white supremacy of the core crimes that can be prosecuted. Colonialism is not one of them. The fact that there's a temporal limit on what can be prosecuted means that all colonial atrocities are beyond you know, um, actual prosecution. The fact that there's a complementarity clause which stipulates that the first right of jurisdiction goes to a national court before it becomes the ICC's jurisdiction means that the most advanced, you know, states will probably never, you know, have to appear in the court if they can prosecute, if they have the means and the yeah. um, will to prosecute themselves. I can go on and on, but we know this from the text. 
And now we know this from experience that since the ICC has been established, it's only um, indicted, you know, Arab and African heads of state and, and accused with the, you know, with the exception of Slobodan Milosevic and now the arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. Um, so knowing this, Knowing this, how is it, and I was part of a team that actually filed an ICC petition, so that, that, that's really a contradiction, right? But how is it that we know we appreciate this possibility and still use these tools? Well, the way that I use this with my team is to agitate. We use that as, as an entry point in order to create the controversy that now needed to be addressed. Now it became you know, a top-line media question. Now we can we can actually make and we could before without the petition, but the petition certainly helped. But that gave us the platform and the opportunity to make our charges yeah. and to call for arrest warrants even before we appear in court, which is probably not going to you know happen anytime soon. Kareem Khan, the prosecutor, has already visited Israeli families um, who are you know survivors of the October 7th um, operation, the attacks, and already concluded that there was a likely um, that Hamas committed war crimes. And yet it took six years between 2015 and 2021 for the ICC to decide that it, you know, Palestine does have jurisdiction after it, it acceded. And it, it, the investigation has been open for two years since 2021. And Khan has not spoken to any Palestinians in Gaza, despite the fact that this is not the first war that the large scale offensive onslaught that they've been subjected to. And consider that just earlier this year, in February, 35 Palestinian human rights organizations approached Khan because the beginning of this year, as you remember, Frank, was promised to be the deadliest year in Palestinian history since 2005. And so approach the prosecutor with that appeal in February. And yet here we are in the midst of genocide with this legacy. And where is Kareem Khan? So one way to see that is to be, you know, horribly disappointed and to give up, right? We've done everything we can. We've mobilized, we've held marches in the millions. We've sustained this, you know, um, this, this um, charge of genocide. And yet here we are. One way to respond to that is to just give up. That's really disheartening. And it occurred to me, and this is why I shared what you're sharing there, that I wanted to, to remind folks that we actually won. We actually have already achieved, you know, what this genocide convention um, enabled us to do, which is to name this atrocity. In Guernica, the city has already blared the siren warning of genocide. Every time there's a march chanting cease fire now and free Palestine, that is a siren of genocide. And that we should not take, we should not take the collusion of these international legal institutions which sustain white supremacy and the supremacy of a Western you know, colonial order as somehow a mark of our failure, but actually just as, as part of the struggle. And, that, and that's how we, continue, we need to continue to be strategic against them. To win, you know, to, to actually win in, in this, um, you know, demonstrating genocide outside of the courtroom because genocide was committed and genocide was immoral even before it was proscribed in the 1948 in the Genocide Convention. Does the absence of a convention mean it didn't happen? Does the absence of a ruling mean it didn't happen? Of course not. Of course not. So do not put our faith in those institutions that are not there to protect us in the first place. And to the extent that we use those institutions, we need to do so with a healthy dose of, dose of skepticism um, and you know, just very strategically in, in how we're going to move all with the intent of building power which is why, um, Frank, one of the things you and I worked on was very useful in this regard. You spearheaded, right? You organized 
the Russell, uh, the, the Russell Tribunal on Palestine in four different locations that found that the U.S. was a pillar in Israel's, um, you know, apartheid, prolonged occupation, the usurpation of self-determination, the violation of these preemptory norms. You were part, you know, the, the, the one in South Africa that found that Israel practiced apartheid in 2013. Right. Years before yeah. um, the international um, legacy, human rights legacy organizations uh, uh, caught up to it. And frankly, years after, decades after, Palestinian intellectuals um, and organizers and activists and revolutionaries and fighters had had demonstrated the same thing. So we continue that legacy. Last question, Noura. You've re partly responded. We've... Um... I remember, again, I go back to Operation Castlade because on a personal level, it felt like a, a moment that will change everything. You know, I remember talking to activists and, and, and legal scholars, and, you know, this moment is going to change everything. Israel's gone too far. Israel shot itself in the foot. But then we went back to normal in a way, right? And then there was another one mm. in 2012 and in 2014. And in, you know, the, the massacres in Gaza, are like, you know, there's so many of them. So uh, I don't know how you feel. But I feel like this one, I just feel it inside. I feel it in my body, in my vein. That this one does changes everything. The, 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 something's changed. The, the fact that we can talk about genocide. I mean, the Russell Tribunal in, uh, was in New York, we wanted to address genocide. But then a lot of people said, no, we can't talk about genocide. Let's talk about sociocide. Uh, but now we talk about genocide Remember openly, it. you know. Uh, so, in a way, my question is, does, does this moment change everything? Or how do we make sure it does change everything? I think the latter question is actually the most apt one. I don't think, you know, here's the thing. I, I agree with you. It certainly changes everything. The question is, how do we define time and change, right? Is it an immediate change or not? Um, and, and so, yeah, in my estimation, unfortunately, what we, what we're seeing, we're about to see something much worse in Palestine, as you know, we see, uh, we, against the Palestinian citizens of the state who can't even like posts, mm. they can't mm. even like posts on social media without being fired or arrested or the Palestinians um, in East Jerusalem, who are now being subject to, to outright cleansing, where the settlers are being armed and transformed to an explicit paramilitary unit. Or in Gaza, where Israel is planting flags along the shore of Palestinian cities. Or in the United States or across European geographies, where structures of repression are actually now just taking shape that are criminalizing intifada. From the river to the sea, Free Palestine. There was a, a podcast that literally tried to liken Free Palestine to Hail Hitler. My God. For us, this is so absurd, but it's also the beginning, I think, of a, a, a much worse moment to come in terms of our repression. And so we need to prepare for that and not to be disheartened by that either. But that, that tightening that I think is on the horizon. Um, that violence, that crude coercive force that's on the horizon, that's far more crude even than what we've seen, is an indication of the absolute failure of the moral authority of Zionism. That if there was an argument to be made that now it lacks moral authority that can sustain it, and instead it's outright coercive force, to the point where Zionists in the United States who are a minority and have the most to lose through, you know, clamping down on free speech are advocating for clamping down on free speech, right? They are working against their own interests. They are strengthening a police state that will not just attack black, brown, and indigenous peoples, but that will attack everybody. And so um, I, I, 
those of us who are paying attention know that the critical amongst us know that the people who are not speaking are not speaking precisely because they know that. And they're afraid of this repression. But what it also indicates is that there is a common understanding that there is a lid being placed on. And a lid placed on that much pressure cannot be maintained. Impossible. Impossible. So, of course, nothing will be the, the same, right? The question is, how do we define that time and define that change? I've placed it in the locus of a generation that has similarly identified, you know, has similarly identified that adults have failed them, have betrayed them on issues of climate, gun control, racial justice, trans, you know, the protection of, of, of transgender life on gender justice. These people, you know, 18 to 35, but also much younger who aren't counted amongst the, uh, you know, the, the constituents who are being polled are the future, are the future. There is no way the universe they create after experiencing this moment looks like the universe we live in now. It's impossible. It's impossible. And so that's where, that's where I see this, this change coming about. I see it as being generational. I see it as being iterative. I see it as also um, being preceded by a tremendous more amount of pressure and repression than we've experienced so far. Um, and, I, and I just encourage folks to continue to take care of one another to continue in the legacies of, you know, that we have learned, um, especially during COVID where folks learn to take care of one another in, in the failure of government and in government betrayal, especially in the moment of black uprising where abolition um, became mainstreamed almost, you know, in, in a matter of weeks to think about what does it mean, right? Um, in the words of Ruth Wilson Gilmore and also um, Miriam Kaba, this concept of creating life-affirming conditions, life-affirming conditions. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm at on this. And I, and I encourage us all to keep faith and not to lose it. Thank you so much, Noura. I, I hope you know how much uh, I appreciate you. I, I, I'd love to, to hug you, but I'll, I'll send you a, a virtual hug. Yeah, I'm smiling real hard so I don't cry. You know, if you smile really hard, you just push back. It's, <laughs> this is a very, you said earlier, you said earlier you're on the brink of tears. I mean, I cry at any given moment. Mm. I'll be fine. I'll be walking, you know, to pick up m m my daughter yeah. from somewhere and I'll just cry. Rand I mean, this is just where we're at. This is not, this is just where we're at. And I think that that's, you know, this is wonderful because it means we're human still. Love you, Nura. Thank you, Frank. Love you too. Yalla.